Welcome to Sacred Justice, a podcast that features discourse rooted in the pursuit of justice as sacred practice. Our weekly discussions reflect on current events, art, media, theology, and how they intersect with the movements for freedom and liberation. We hope that through these conversations, we can foster inclusivity by expanding our learning opportunities. We hope to cultivate digital community beyond the confines of our campus. And we hope to reconnect the church's social and spiritual callings. Join us for the journey. This episode contains brief mentions of suicide. If you or someone you know is struggling, please dial the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. Please listen with care and care for those around you this holiday season. Hello, friends. Welcome back to Sacred Justice, our, um, what are we calling this, Sacred Adventure series around the holidays. It's been an adventure too, Mia, these podcasts. (laughs) It has been an adventure. Ha ha. Wow. Yeah, I see that wordplay. Well done. (laughs) I do what I can. Um, You're like, you're you're Sondheim right now. Your wordplay. I I wish. I dream of a day (laughs) when I could be compared to that man. Um, uh, Welcome back to our sacred adventure. We're on episode three of this four part series. And I am here with Ben Boswell. Ben Boswell. I'm Mia McLean. And we're going to jump right on in here. Um, yeah. So previous episodes, we've talked a little bit about holiday traditions. We've talked about some of the things we're looking forward to and we're hoping um, hoping for. Um, on that first episode and second episode, we were getting ready for Thanksgiving. And now Thanksgiving has happened. Ben, how was that for you kind of coming through? This is our second year in COVID Thanksgiving mode. Yeah. Well, it was a lot different than last year. Last year, like we ate outside, you know, and we were only there for a short time. And anytime we went inside, we were wearing masks and it was just a different experience. So this year was, this year was way better. Um, you know, really close friend gave me this amazing macaroni and cheese recipe and, uh, no, it was Mia who gave me this amazing recipe for mac and cheese that involved making a custard, which I had never done before. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was awesome. Mm. It was awesome. And, uh, yeah. What do they say, me? I put my foot in there. You put your that, foot in. And some, that and some corn, some cream corn that I made from scratch Ooh. that was on point. My dad said he thought that really stole the show, even over the mac and cheese. Wow. Now, I, have, I have to tell you a quote from my mom about the mac and cheese. I, she's probably not gonna like that. I say this as she was eating it, she was like, this mac and cheese is so good. I want to eat it in a closet. <laughs> and we were all like, you want? To, why do you want to eat it? And she was like, she was saying that I want to eat it all alone in the closet. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> like, I, I don't understand that. But my wife Andy was like, no, I get that totally. I understand that completely. That's exactly how good it was. Oh, good. But I, I guess there's food that's so good you want to take it all by yourself and yes. take all of it and go into a closet and eat it alone. I that's can, how good the mac and cheese was. I can see that. Um, by the way, that recipe was from a, a woman named Danny Rose. And mm. she has a YouTube channel called Stove Top Kisses that I follow. I think she's hilarious. Everything it she cooks is it's more than just a cooking show. It's like comedy. Life show. Yeah, it's a life show. Yeah, yeah, it is. I love her so much. And she's from the South. She lives in California right now. But that's where I got that recipe from. And the reason why I went with that recipe when I made mac and cheese a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, so ago, is because it's only one cheese. And I was just kind of getting fatigued with like, the Gouda. four and five cheese. No and, yeah, and- I'm like, y'all, that's y'all are doing the most. And also, like, I was getting really fatigued with the bechamel sauce, which is like when you make a, a cream cheese sauce. Yeah. I just was feeling like that's so I don't remember, like, my ancestors doing that. That's so something else. It's OK. It's good. Yeah, it tastes good. But um, I, I liked how simple hers was. Um and it didn't involve some of those other more tedious processes, you know. So yeah. I'm glad you enjoyed that. Also, I do, yeah. too, make cream corn. I have a it's called cream corn mesho. 
it's a Creole cream corn. So if you ever okay. want to, you know, try something else, you know. Yes, I will because I, I mine, you know, you start with a mine started with a roux, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't, you know, I didn't have the Trinity in there. Oh. So I had th two out of the three. I don't, I didn't, I don't put celery in stuff like you do. I don't understand the celery. Okay, it's the Trinity, Ben. It's the Trinity. Well. I some, it's just kind of like the regular Trinity. Some of the parts I don't want. You okay. know, I don't need all of it in the regular Trinity. You know, just give me the spirit. I'm okay with. I don't really need all the other things. I don't always put celery in it. Um, okay, okay. Because celery goes bad really quickly, and I never use all of it, and so I, I don't buy it if I can't buy small. Um, but as long as you, you have onion and bell the, pepper. You got to explain the Holy Trinity to people. Right? Um, onion, bell pepper, and celery is the Creole slash Cajun, but mostly Creole Holy Trinity. So it's almost the base seasoning for every Creole dish, etouffee, gumbo, um, shrimp Creole. I mean, everything starts with the Trinity. I don't always have time. I don't always buy celery because I just hate feeling like I'm wasting food because I never use all of the stocks, you know. Mm -hmm. But um. If I do have it, I'll, I'll 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 get it. But I usually always have bell pepper and onion in my house. Now with the cream corn macho, I put green bell pepper and red. Mm -hmm. in addition, mm -hmm. so, you know, just oh, yeah, makes it very Christmassy. Yeah, it looks a little colorful. You got the yellow corn. You got the you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, anyway, enough food. But anyway, okay. <laughs> so we had so we had a good Thanksgiving, and we had this really funny moment. I just preached on laughing, and some folks who are listening to this will have heard that sermon. If you haven't, it, it's it was a fun one. Um, and I was going to say in the sermon that, you know, I was trying to encourage people to have some laughter in Advent, which I think is kind of the contrast of what we're going to talk about today in this podcast. But, um, I had the, I, I had that full belly total laugh, the, the, the biggest laughter I've had in like months at Thanksgiving table, because I don't somehow during dinner, we remembered because, you know, you're always remembering stuff when you're at Thanksgiving, things, your memories are flooding back good and bad. Mm -hmm. And um, this was really the first one with Andy, my my new wife, and uh, that she was able to be at because last year with being COVID, she was not going to come. And so Lucy and Andy and my family were there. And I remembered this game that my mother taught me back when she was my youth minister uh, in a church previously, which explains everything <laughs> about why I messed up. And um, it was a game called Poor Kitty. Do you know this game? Have you heard this game? Okay, so in the original game, I, this is a stupid aside, but I'm going to just say it anyway. So in the original game, everybody sits in a circle and one person pretends to be a cat and goes up to ev another person and meows. And if the person can pet them and say, poor kitty, three times without laughing after each meow, then the cat has to continue on to the next person. But if you laugh at the meow, you become the cat. Okay. Okay. So it's like a warm up game with, uh, like with youth, and it's fun and it's a way to get to know each other. And, uh, you know, anyway, but it's, you know, so, you, you know, you're getting on all fours and you're being a cat. So it's really funny. Well, my mom, we were, we were, I was bringing the game up, and my mom, for whatever reason, got confused, even though she's the one that taught me the game. And she was, she thought everybody was a cat in the circle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that one person was not a cat and would go around. <laughs> so more like duck, duck, goose. Yes. Because <laughs> you got it wrong. And like we couldn't convince her that she was wrong. And so then we all just started pretending to be cats at the <laughs> Thanksgiving table, <laughs> meowing at her until she finally realized that she was wrong. And it was really fun. We were laughing. It doesn't sound as funny as it was, but we were like spitting out food laughing. Mm. Anyway, we had a good time. Good. Good. Oh, that's fun. That sounds. How fun. about you? How was yours? Um, it was interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I discovered two things through this whole Thanksgiving ordeal. Um, I it's not so much that I'm an introvert as it is I get easily bored. Oh, okay. So that was a discovery that I made. Um, hmm. You know, I was in a house full of people, and I was just bored out of my mind. Hmm. None of the conversation was was really catching my attention. So I just went to go clean dishes. I got it from the I got it from the Thanksgiving table with like 15 people. And I went to go clean all the dishes in the kitchen as my as my gift to the host of the, of the shindig. But um, I just I found so much of it incredibly boring. And that's not a commentary on the host. That's not them. It's just kind of like 
a table full of people who aren't saying anything that's really piquing my interest for an extended right. period of time. So I'm, I was bored, so I left and went home. I left. I mm. left the people who were staying with me. I left them at the host house and I went home, and they found a way. They found a ride home. <laughs> you are amazing. Yeah, I just. Oh my God, I, like, I feel like I like I. This is what the kind of thing that makes me like feel like I need to invite you to a different gathering because like that was more interesting. Oh my God, that's so so sad. It, I mean, it, it is. It was a learning. It was a learning moment. I just kind of was like, why? I was like, I wasn't tired, and I like it wasn't so much that I was tired of people. They nobody was just saying anything that was you know interesting. None of the conversations are interesting. We don't all we don't watch the same TV. We don't mm, read the same mm-hmm. books if anybody reads books at all. Like it's just kind of like, you know, it was very much a reminder that um a lot of my frustrations this year really stemmed from boredom. Yeah. <laughs> people, people who bore me. They bore me. I don't have anything to say. I don't even have anything to talk about. So, yeah. Um, well, that, I mean, a lot of people, there are a lot of people, I know a lot of people that don't really do well with what we would call small talk. Right. And it's not because they don't it's not because they can't talk about things that are not, you know, more day to day. It's that there's a certain engage. There's a certain kind of small talk that is so trivial that it's boring to people where they just it's just like, I can't with this. It's like this is not going anywhere. You know, like you and I, we can talk about food for hours. We can talk about food for hours. That's that some people would think that's small talk, but it's not trivial because it's like this is life. This is. Food is life. Um, so how do you help? Like, yeah, that's the that's hard. How do you help lean now, in with people? Who now, really what could have helped Ben hearing your story is if there were some more structure. So a lot of the spaces yeah. that I'm around with my peers have little structure. So it's not like we're playing a game, right? We're not playing a game. We're not doing something that could um, that could help curate a experience. You know, yeah. so we're not doing anything. So then the conversation becomes very something I'm not interested in. And I just get up and do something else, you know. So, yeah, that could help if there's more structure. But, uh, you know, I, I was that, makes me, that makes me wonder if you had any white women there, because that's sort of part of why my life is so structured. All the white <laughs> women have structure. <laughs> I mean, if it ain't my mom is my wife. Everybody's got structure. You know, it's somebody is putting some kind of mm-hmm. like, no, we're going to meet at this time. Yeah. We need to be here at this time. And then when the move, the meal is over, that's when we're going to share our gratitude. Yeah, none of that. And then after the gratitude, then we have dessert. You can have a little break if you want. And then after dessert, then we're going to maybe watch some football or watch a movie. Yeah. You know, it's like a, it's very structured. You know? I miss, I miss a little bit of that from some, we were talking about nostalgia on the previous episode. I really do miss a little bit of that. We used to play games after we ate. So mm. it was very much like dinner was at 2 p.m. We hung out a little bit. You had seconds and thirds. Some people went to go watch football. Others went to go play downstairs, play phase 10 or something else, right? Like there was a, there was a rhythm that mm-hmm. when you are having Thanksgiving with a bunch of different people who have never had Thanksgiving together before, there is no rhythm unless the host sets that rhythm. Right. Um, right so, right, right. so I was just, it's just, it was a learning experience for me. I was like, okay, so if I had to choose between 20, 20 and 2021, I would choose the Thanksgiving I had in 2020 where I made a steak, mac and cheese, collard greens, and watched Jingle Jangle. See, but you had a rhythm. Yeah. You set your own rhythm as the host of your own party. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you had a you had a party, but you had food and you had jingle jangle. Right. Yeah, that's so good. It was great. So learning from it was fine. I'm not complaining too much, but it was fine. But it just was uh it was exhausting. Um, and it was a learning moment for me because I wasn't coming home and going to sleep. I was coming home and getting on Twitter with the rest of the people who were bored out of their minds on things. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, that's like awesome. we need to have Thanksgiving. My Twitter, like the Twitter crew that like we tweet a lot to each other. We need to have Thanksgiving next year. <laughs> now, you just brought up a really interesting idea. What what would it be like? See, that's the hard thing about family, chosen family, proximity, mm-hmm. and Thanksgiving, yeah. right? We have we have family, some of whom live close, some of whom don't. Then we have chosen family, some of whom live close and some of whom don't. Mm-hmm. And and so how do we how do we do Thanksgiving with the people who we if we could like let's say if we could say if if we could have Thanksgiving dinner with anybody in the world, oh. 
who would be at our Thanksgiving table? You know, I'm not talking about like, yeah. oh, Jesus, you know, like <laughs> not living or dead. Thank you. Right. Plus, Jesus would probably not like Thanksgiving. So no, uh, don't invite Jesus to dinner if you want to have a good time. Um, you know, like for, like what friends would be there? Like if yeah. you could just magically put all the friends that you would want. Uh, and so for me, I you know, have a lot of white lady friends, so I would still be very structured. Um, but <laughs> I'm thinking about all my friends who are white women now, and I got to tell you, I, mean, I love I love them so much. But there's no way it would not be structured. And and you know, there's there's a certain I like structure sometimes, and I think that I would have, and I've also learned I would have had a better entire week had there been some structure and not just sort of this playing it by ear where we're kind of going to try to do this on Friday, but like, what time are we doing this on Friday? What time are we doing so sad? Yeah. Because that's, that's, I have to yeah. prepare my spirit as an introvert, as somebody who has uh-huh. to be ready for it. I have to know, okay, we're going skating. Okay. When, if we don't have, if we don't have a set, who's buying the tickets, who's making the reservation. Like, so right. then it just doesn't happen. It falls flat. And so I'm like, but I don't also want to be that person because I'm tired. <laughs> you don't want to have to take on all the structure yourself. Yeah. So yeah, it's interesting a lot. stuff. But that's good to think about. I mean, like, I, I wonder what it would be like to have Thanksgiving with, like, people I actually feel like we would have some really good conversation. It would want to make yeah. stay up till three o'clock in the morning type Thanksgiving, you know. But, well, and I sometimes feel like we, we, we forget to think through, like, I think we we imagine everybody's got plans. They're all going to go see their family. Mm-hmm. You don't want to get into mess it, mess up those plans, mm-hmm. you know. But you know, what if it was like in October around Halloween, we're all we all just or earlier because you might have to make plane flights. But said, who do I want to have Thanksgiving with? Mm-hmm. Not who do I have to have Thanksgiving yeah. with? Yeah. Who do I want to have Thanksgiving with? Yeah. And let me go ahead and tell them I will fly you here. I will pay for your flight. I will pay for your train ticket. If you will come, I will cook. I will host. I'll make the food. You know, I just, I just don't want to be bored again. <laughs> I'm just thinking about you. I just, I want to have Thanksgiving with with chosen family. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Interesting. Whew. Maybe I'll do that next year. We'll see. I think we ought to, we we have to be able to do some traditions that have worked and find new ones. Yeah. Right. That's the thing every year. Yeah. Well, that was fun. Um, well, let's let's talk about some current events, Ben. What is percolating? Mm. What's on your radar that is just when you think about the work that we've been called to do as people fighting for justice? Mm. Um, what is going on? <laughs> what's what's at the top of your list? <laughs> well, obviously, for me, at the top of my list is got to be Omicron, and we're still early in learning about what Omicron is, this variant. And I got to tell you, you know, this actually goes deeply into what um, we are going to talk about in this podcast, but just the news of Omicron, uh, I felt a lot like the stock market, you know, Mm. it was just like, uh, not, not recessed, not depressed, but a punch in the stomach, Mm -hmm. you know, Uh, it was like, okay, we're just now getting to this point. Lucy, my daughter was just fully vaccinated last week. I've been, I've been boosted. Um, I'm ready to go back to some restaurants and eat inside mm-hmm. and go to the movies. And I got some things I want to do. Mm-hmm. You know, it's cold. I don't want to be sitting around outside, even if there's a fire yeah. all night long. Yeah. You know, um, and and I also was worried about church. You know, I'm worried about, you know, we're just going to we've just been kind of this will be our first Christmas back in person in two years. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a that's a long time yeah. you know, uh, to go without being able to have Christmas services and. Uh, I mean, I don't have to worry about this. I'm getting ready to go on sabbatical. This will be y'all's problem. But I, I am worried that Omicron, if it, if we find out that it is resistant to vaccinations, I think we're going to be in a real world uh-huh. hurt. Because I, I, I was talking to some people and about it, and, and I said, I'm not sure, you know, that we um, – I'm not sure that society is set up and prepared to handle what will, what will come. I don't think people are going – getting shut back in their houses. No, no. I don't think people are going to stop going to restaurants. I don't think people are going to shut down churches again. I just don't think there's a tolerance level for any of that. I don't think individuals are going to be able to handle it if we have to go back to that. I don't, I guess I'm not, we didn't have the moxie the first time and it wasn't that, it wasn't that big of a deal the first time, Mm -hmm. right? It didn't have to be what it was. Right. Right. We could have just shut down everything for a couple of months and we would have been fine. Yeah. Um, But we couldn't even do it then. 
So how are we going to do it now that we're tired, uh, we're, we're, we're depressed about it? Um, so I'm really hopeful that even if it's more contagious, that it will be still resistant, that the vaccines will still be effective with it so that people can we can just keep doing what we're doing now, which is keep on masking, keep trying to get people vaccinated, keep moving forward. But um, anyway, from a justice angle on that, I will say a couple of things about Omicron that really point out to me the real problems in our world. Like, first of all, Mm -hmm. the fact that it was discovered in South Africa by people who are more advanced scientifically than we are, but then was blamed because they are the only ones who study the genetics of it and have the ability to study the genetics of it right now and are sending out the world and the ones who discovered it and then send it out. And then they get blamed for it as if it originated there. And then we find out, no, 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 no. It had already been all these other places before it, they found it there. But just the fact that it was found there, all of a sudden there, there were these travel bans that come up, right? Mm-hmm. We are quick to do a travel ban on an African country, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> and we did it right there, which is not, which was not effective. And by the way, travel bans in general have been shown to be not effective at all anyway. They only delay it for two weeks at the most, usually one. So all you're doing is delaying the inevitable and destroying your relationship and and stigmatizing African nations out of that. So I thought the injustice of that was kind of an example of where we're at, you know, in, in these in, in global racial dynamics with the global south and the Western, you know, privileged nations of the world. Uh, and the, the you know the former colonized nation colonizing nations of the world um so there's there's there was that the other thing i thought about was <clears throat> there's this whole thing about uh, immunocompromised folks and the vaccine and how this omicron variant probably incubated in someone who was immunocompromised and not vaccinated potentially mm-hmm. uh, and they can tell all this stuff they can tell they can tell that it, it the the kind the the level of mutations that are in this. I, I've been doing a lot of research on this. I may be off on this a little bit because they're still so early, but the level of mutations and where the mutations are located in the virus show us that it probably incubated in one person, and it probably incubated in one person who was immunocompromised. Um. And that means that that person may have had another disease like HIV or something Mm -hmm. that then gave the gave the virus the time to mutate in 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 complicated ways that then when it leaves them and transmits to the next person, you know, it's a whole new virus that's much more more contagious. Um, And so so that's another reminder that we've got to we've those who are most vulnerable are should have been the immunocompromised and should have been our pr- highest priority from the beginning and and always needed to be and vaccinations again are so critical um we might not have had these wild variants had we had the kind of vaccination efforts that we needed to mm. all over the country but especially in the global south where by the way they can't get vaccines yeah we yeah. have and we're throwing them away here we're throwing them away literally oh. Right. So people here are on their boosters and getting third full doses and other people in other countries can't even get their first dose because there's not enough. And so the injustice of that and, and the reality is that it, all it would all it would take would be one company who has a vaccine um, not holding claim on the patent. Right. Yeah. Like um, like happened with polio. Give up. Give this up so they can make a generic version of it. Yeah. And it's not about money anymore. It's about saving lives. But we are not in a, it's not all about money world anymore. No. Oh. So it's, it's horrible. Yeah, it is. And so are we ever going to be free from this? I mean, I guess. <clears throat> mm-hmm. I don't, I don't see an end. I don't see an end. I feel like um, people are just going to die. And we're just going to be like, we're going to be okay with that. Like we're okay with school shootings and people dying in schools, you know? <laughs> <There's> this, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, is it um, Achio Membe, the um, African scholar who, co- who coined the term necropolitics? It's sort of like the governor of Florida, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. We have, we have decided already that there is a segment of the population that we are okay with killing. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and, and we're okay if they die. Mm-hmm. And actually, it's not always who we think it is. Sometimes we think it's only poor folks or nope. only minority folks. But when it comes to guns, 
we are allowing everybody to die. Yeah. Children, high school students. And most of the high, most of the school shootings, this segues to my my current event, but most of the school shootings are in white, predominantly white spaces. Right, which is where that book, there's a book about this called Dying of Whiteness. Um, and it's about um, how America's heartland is so um, addicted to whiteness that they are willing to. It's basically they they have a like a homicidal connection to whiteness. That the very th- the very thing that is uniting them to this kind of politics is this racial identity. But it's it's um, suicidal. Mm. Meaning that all the things that they that this white racial identity ties them to the politics that it ties them to is self-destructive. Yeah. It ties them to people who vote against their health care, people who vote against unions, people who vote against living wage, and people who vote for guns to be proliferated everywhere. I mean, guns to be non-proliferated everywhere, right? So, I mean, it's like, and guns kill more white people yeah. in America. Yeah. Right? Suicide is still number one in gun death, right? Yeah. Gun death from suicide is still the number one cause of gun death, and that's mostly white men my age yeah that's who's killing themselves with guns in the midwest right why wouldn't we want to you know any it's crazy yeah your point yeah it reminds me of something june jordan said in one of her in her book some of us some of us where do i have it oh some of us did not die um and it's a collection of Mm -hmm. essays and she talks about al gore's um law losing the election in 2000 and how he could have fought back but he chose whiteness instead it's a whole, it's a Ooh. whole chapter. I got to find that essay and give it to you, Ben. Oh, I need to send, I need to read but that. But she basically I, says, you know, he chose whiteness over, 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 uh, calling out all of the, the ways in which he lost the election because of the systems that have been put in place, right, to disenfranchise political parties. Oh. He chose whiteness, and she goes on. I'll find the article. I don't want to paraphrase June Jordan, but um, it just sort of, it, you know, when I'm thinking about this school shooting in Michigan. And mm, these parents mm. that were trying to flee and the bail that they, they allowed them to have bail. I'm, Bonnie and Clyde, these parents were. Yeah, just for a minute. It, it, all, all, the timeline leading up to the school shooting, he gets sent to the principal's office. They send them back to class. I mean, just like you just you just you just let okay. this happen. You let this how, happen. How many moments in there Could, where if it was a different person, does this not happen? This kid would have been expelled if they were a kid of color, period. Expelled right. before this happened. Right. At least on the day of the shooting. At least. They would have never been able to come back then. to the campus that day because yeah. they. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. So it's just. Um, well, how about this parent who buys a gun? This, it, it, oh, my God. I, yeah. I mean, they're not. This is not the most. Uh, they, this. These are these parents have not are not the. They're not the ideal parents. They're probably getting worst parents of the year award yeah. if there's if there's an award given this year. Yeah. You got to think about what. How do you get to this point, right? It, it's interesting to me now strategically that they've sued the parents. Yeah. Over there, that families are suing the parents because that could provide a new angle through which people might find at least some legal recourse without having to sue the NRA or go after the gun manufacturers because they have not found any other way to hold anyone accountable for the kind of school shootings that have been happening. Mm-hmm. I, I think back to the, the families of Dylan Klebold um, and the shooters at Columbine. If this had happened then, yeah. maybe we would not have had 20 years of, of school shootings. I can't you know? believe it's been. I mean, when was that? Was that 2001? 1999. 1999. I, just, year I graduated high school. I can't believe that it's been 22 years. And we're still having this conversation. I just, when that happened, I just, I just can't believe it. Right. No, I mean, that was, I, I, yeah, it's again, it's shown us how, how um, weak we are in our ability to, to stand against corporations that are making money. Mm. Right. So the gun lobby, the gun lobby is obvious, right? It's obviously making a lot of money. Gun manufacturers pay the lobbyists. They got the NRA there with them. I mean, and the NRA is weaker than it's ever been. It's still look at the power that it wields. Um, yeah, I mean, that's enough to make you depressed right there. But there's, I, I mean, there, maybe it's hope. Maybe there's some hope there in that story, saying like now we can hold these parents accountable. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I was thinking about when you were saying that the timeline, and I was thinking about that school principal 
right? I, and I, the reason I think about this is because I think we all have to think through our power mm -hmm. as, as individuals in the world. You get this chance, you have this meeting with these parents and this child, right? Clearly this meeting did not go well. Something happened in this meeting, you know, there had to be indicators. I mean, I have, I have some empathy for this principle because we don't always understand the situations that we're in when we're in them, but something either was said or was not said that could have been said in that meeting or some disciplinary action that needed to be taken that maybe wasn't taken or something that could have been done to change the outcome of that situation so that we don't end up where we are. And I, I think it's a, it's a reminder to all of us that when we are in positions of power, whether it be a school principal or we uh, we manage staff at a bank or a or a law office um, or we're dealing with court cases or we're at a church and you're like me and you're in a position of, of of leadership, we have a tremendous responsibility to kind of keep our eyes open, not just about the person in front of us, but the community around them mm -hmm. and who's and who's in danger and who could be harmed by this and who who is our responsibility to. Um, and that goes for everything from racial justice to economic justice to just general public safety. Yeah. Right? yeah. I think about that and all the pastors who've made these choices to just bring their worshipers back without masks or any yeah. any protocol of any kind. I mean, what what kind of leadership is that? I mean, really, what yeah. does that mean that you would put? I mean, they say they're putting God above all this, but we know it's the money. It's money. Right? It's, Always. it's the bottom line. You know, yeah. and it's like, I mean, if that's what church is about. Whew. Nope. Nope. <sighs> well, there's that was a good, that was a good Advent sigh right there, man. That's it's the Advent sigh because I just all I have these days, and <laughs> our by the time you hear this, we we'll, we will have come through the Gaudete Sunday mm, joy, mm. and I was leading a small group this past Sunday on peace and I was telling them about joy that's coming up. And one of the co-leaders said, um, he, he goes, this is going to be the week that I struggle the most with joy. You know, mm. uh, I struggle with hope. I struggle with, you know, hope, mostly hope, but he says he struggles with the joy week of Advent. And I think that that's, that's fitting with everything that we've just named that's going on in the world between Omicron and this, this school shooting, the latest school shooting, actually, I think there was another one recently, but I don't think yeah. anybody died. I'm not sure who I can't keep up. So what a day. So what do yeah, you know? So, yeah. So, um, and everything that's happening, how do we cultivate joy? But we also want to, acknowledge that everybody is not cultivating joy. That's not even a possibility for them right now. Um, and that grief is so heavy mm. in our in our world, particularly the past two years. How do we make space for lamentation in such a season where everything is holiday movies, where people, you know, meet the love of their life? on a farm Ooh. how do we how do we make space for lamentation when you know every store you walk into is playing jingle bells like how do we really do that you know mm. as a church as a society we haven't even had a national like a real lamentation a lamenting moment since covid started over 700,000 deaths and we haven't really mourned them there's a thing that happens when you don't mourn and one one of the authors that I I've read on this calls it unattended sorrow. Mm. And so it's like when you don't attend to your sorrow, it gets lodged in the body in some place. And the body is also your mind. So your, your brain, but the sorrow becomes trauma that gets located in the body somewhere that just sits there and mm. remains unprocessed, unattended to unrelieved, and see, this is where some of those other traditions, like the Pentecostal tradition and other places have a little something on us because they know that the body is carrying those burdens and they'll have like a, I went through a whole Pentecostal worship service one time where the, the proclaimer just kept saying in, in the course of a prayer over and over again, release the burden. Mm. Release, release. And so people just started shouting out everything that they were, that, that they were carrying. They were just yelling it out, right? And you know, some were speaking in tongues, but they're just shouting out the burdens, all the burdens. And he's he just kept saying, "Release the burden." And then he'd say, "No, no, no, you didn't, you didn't get to it yet. 
Mm-hmm. You know, go down deeper, go deeper, go down, find the burden even, even deeper. And we're, we don't do a lot of that in our, in our church because <laughs> we, <laughs> we don't do a lot of releasing the burden. Everything's and I, so quiet, you know, got to be proper. Yeah. But I do think that the mainline church is better on, on lament, for instance, like we create, we do create spaces for lament, some, some mainline churches. So the season of Lent, the season of Advent, the fact that we have seasons creates a space where there is a, a, a journey that is usually through some kind of wilderness, which is a space for lamentation, mm-hmm. uh, a space for going through precarity and loneliness and wilderness and struggle. And then you lead toward a celebration that comes at the end. So there's a rhythm that happens with, through the liturgical year um, when you have space. And so Advent is supposed to be a season of uh, where there is lament, lament over our own um, you know, failings, uh, uh, you know, finitude, um, you know, the missing parts of our lives where our, the lack of wholeness in our society, the lack of justice, um, you know, the lack of it being the kingdom yet, like we're, you know, we're always waiting. Mm-hmm. We're always waiting for the kingdom and the kingdom's not here. It's, it's partly here, but it's not yet. Um, and then, you know, um, and I've noticed that the, there's a difference in mainline and evangelical churches on this. So, there was a study done a couple years ago that studied all contemporary Christian music praise songs mm. that have been written since they started been writing. So it's, we only have like 30 something years of history at this point to study. And they were 99.5% praise um, or gratitude. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And, but the Psalms of the Bible, which is where most praise songs come from, the Psalms of the Bible are 40% lament. Yeah. So there's a lot of evangelical churches out there that are never lamenting in any of their music, which music is where you have to lament. It's got to come from a place that goes down into the soul. Um, and so now there, that's where the you know, l- mainline liturgical traditions do have a space for some of that lament in hymn, hymnody and in, um, and in the seasonal, liturgical seasonal. But I still think even in the mainline tradition, we don't get deep enough mm-hmm. in really – really creating space for lament yeah you know yeah because we don't want to we really don't want to no no we don't and also we try to control it too much i think i Mm -hmm. think i was reading this article about grief and how exhausting grief is and how so much of our tiredness is connected to grief, right? Just it, it just drains your energy. Grief, anxiety, depression is exhausting. Mm. And so then we we decide to create a space for something and it has to be like it has to be like this in 45 minutes and blah blah blah. And like it's almost like we exhaust ourselves trying to create the space where we can rest. Yep. That's right. <laughs> you no? Know? We're supposed that's to right. come in and rest. You lay your burdens down like the song says and I feel like the mainline traditions can often over-program it. And it's Definitely. not just a space where you come and you, you know. It's too prescribed. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. and I think, oh, man, what would that be like if it was really wide open? I mean, it, it, it could be like, you know, testimony service where it goes four hours mm-hmm. long. Mm-hmm. And nobody wants to be there for that. Well, I mean, there, you come and go. You come and go. The thing, so the thing, it's interesting that you're saying that. I think part of the, part of the thing we forget about grief is that it's exhausting because it demands expression. So it's like a lot of emotions are like this, right? Where if we don't find ways to express them somehow, whether it be in song, writing, telling someone out loud, communicating it, yelling, exercising our bodies to get these emotions out or whatever, um, then they just stay, again, lodged in here like burdens and trauma that we can't get rid of. So I was thinking about how, but when we do express it, when we can find a way to express it, there's a relief. There's a, there's a, there's a space. It may not be long, but there's a space where your body feels a different feeling, Mm -hmm. right? Like think about how after you really cry, like finally something gets you and you finally decide, no, I, I, you can't hold it back in anymore. And you just let yourself go and you cry. And then after you cry, you're like, oh yeah, man, maybe I can carry this. Yeah. A little. 
a little longer, right? And it's like the body is demanding expression. So the body wants you to cry about grief, but when you when you refuse to cry because you're at work or you're you don't want to cry, you're trying to hold it all in, right? You're 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 you're, you're actually exhausting your body more because the grief's already exhausting, and then you're holding it in. You're doing you're doing twice as much. Yeah. With it, right. Um, and so like we're carrying all this. I I have an example of this where when I you know when I when I when I first got divorced, I was going to pick up Lucy. And she was living in Raleigh at the time. And so I would drive all the way up there, two and a half, three hours, pick her up and drive back or whatever. Or I drive her to drop her off after a weekend. This was every other weekend. I did this for two years. Um, and I couldn't like, I would drop her off and I would just feel this horrific amount of grief, mm -hmm. right? She's really young. She didn't understand all that was going on at the time. And I was just, and, and I just, I was missing her and I, I, and I would feel it right after I, um, right after I dropped her off. Right. So mm -hmm. it's like, I'm feeling this. So what I would, what I was noticing about myself is I was st first thing I would do is like, I'd throw on some kind of podcast or something and just try to distract my brain from it. Well, what I was doing was not attending to the sorrow. So mm -hmm. I started bottling it in and bottling it. In. And then I'd get home from a three hour drive, exhausted by the grief and the drive. And I would just be miserable. Right. Mm -hmm. And not 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 fun to be around and whatever. And I, and I just didn't I had not released the burden. I had not allowed myself to grieve mm -hmm. what I was experiencing. So I I created a life hack around this and I started playing a song right after I dropped her off that I knew would make me cry mm -hmm. and would make me ball. That reminded me of her and reminded me of my feelings about, you know, all this stuff. And I would play that song as many times as I needed to, to cry on the ride home. And then once I did that, then I was okay. And I would get home relaxed. I would be, it was cathartic. It was like a release. You know, yeah. I was releasing. That's what crying's about, right? That's what the body's trying to say. I can't hold this in anymore, you know? And so we, and we're pushing it down and not allowing ourselves to cry is just going to make things harder for us. Yeah. Yeah, I felt I felt a little bit of that over Thanksgiving. I felt like I was surrounded by a bunch of people who weren't talking about the thing, mm -hmm. which is, you know, um, my friend who killed himself in August. And the, there was a several of us there who were close to this person. And I sort of like I sort of felt like y'all aren't talking about the thing. And so one when I was one of the, one of the moments that I was sneaking out because I was tired of people, because yeah. <laughs> I don't say goodbye, I just leave. Um, so I was sneaking out because I was over, I was just kind of over the space and just, I'm just wasn't in the mood. And one of the women who was really close to our, our mutual friend, she was like sobbing in a pri like the private office near the door. Um, I just kind of, and she was like looking at his funeral program and I just kind of like oh. let her, I just like let her be. And I left and I, I texted the host and I was like, so and so was like, you know, going through it. You want may want to check on them, blah blah. But you know, I was sort of feeling. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm anticipating a, at some point, some shoe was gonna drop and people. Uh -huh. Yes, maybe I'm just reading too much into this. I mean, maybe because this is what we do for a living, so we're kind of like, this is not we healthy. Have, yeah. <laughs> Well, we have a, we have created our own rhythms to process other people's grief, including our own. Right, right. right. So I, I'm, 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 I feel a lack of rhythm in some of these people. Like there's no rhythm to the processing of grief, and in a moment where you can do this in a group, right? Because I think it's important to not do all of the processing of grief alone. I think you need to do some of it alone, and then do some of it with other people. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm just, I'm having those, I'm having those feelings like it's going to, the, the stuff's going to hit the fan at some point. Well, and it's going to come out in all kinds of which sideways right. ways that don't look like grief at all. Right. It's look like anger yeah. or, or yeah. acting out. Um, I mean, all kinds of stuff that yeah. could happen. You yeah. Know? Um, I, and I think, so I've been thinking a lot about this definition of grief. I'm sure I read this somewhere and somebody told it to me, but that, but anyway, I'm using it now because I love it. And it's it's that grief is the love we still have for someone after or something once it's gone. Mm -hmm. so, and it's and so grief is love. 
Grief is really love that we we don't know how to express to because we can't express it to the person or about the thing because it's no longer here. So we feel this deep sense of love for it and there's no way to to communicate or to experience that love, right? Except through process except through grief. And so we don't think about our tears as love. We don't think about our our, our frustration, our anger, our bargaining as forms of love, but it's really our way. Grief is our way of loving those who have gone or the things that we've already lost after they're gone. Mm -hmm. And if we don't figure out how to express that, right, then it gets all bottled up in here and it starts to mess with all, all the other things we love in our lives, mm -hmm. all the other people we love, mm -hmm. all the things that we love, because it's just, just sitting in here. And it needs somewhere to go. It can't just sit in there uh, without becoming its own problem, yeah. right? And so this is where I think Christian uh, grief practices, funeral practices are very insufficient and inadequate to deal with the complexity of grief. So we expect people who have lost a loved one um, to make all these decisions, the biggest decisions they'll ever make in their lives, mm -hmm. in a seven-day period from the death of their loved one. Yes, Yes. Right. And then we have this funeral service, which we only do one time and we never repeat. <laughs> um, and yeah. it is what it is for them. And it's gone. It's like a wedding. Right. The pressure is on. It's got to be all these speakers, the right music. Da, right. Da, da, da. And then it's over and it's like, go home. Some thankfully, some cultural practices at least go drink or something after that and have a wake. Right. So that they have some way to like talk about someone mm -hmm. and not in a church service, right? And it's not just sitting in a receiving line and, oh, I knew them from work or whatever, you know, paying respects. It's actual conversation about a person and what they meant to you, a deep level. This is where the Jewish tradition is so much better. A year later, a year later to today, that's when mm -hmm. they get back together, mm -hmm. right? That's when they they come back to have that practice because yeah. it takes a year for the body to process the loss of someone. Yeah, yeah. I was telling, I was trying to when when this when this friend um, took his own life back in August, and there was all these different like feelings, and I was managing all these different people's feelings. Right, there were people who were like upset because it was a Catholic service and mm. no, they couldn't be on program. There was people upset because they couldn't do X, Y, and Z. And I was trying to explain to them, I was like, you know, you can do something with your small group of people next mm. year, right? Y'all can go to the beach and talk mm -hmm. about this person, right? Y'all can do, y'all can create your own ritual. That's not, this funeral is about his parents. See, when the thing about it is that when you die and you have parents, they get to make all decisions. Right. <laughs> You're not right. married. You have no children. Right. So I was trying to explain to them that part of their lamentation process is to be revisiting this later on while they're mm -hmm. in their, you know, close group of friends. Right. The people who understand what everything that's occurred. Um, I, I think they'll get around to that. I'm not trying to force people to, to go through their processes of grief, but I don't think that we have been trained on how to do this. And we only know this because we do this. Mm. <laughs> like we mm -hmm. only know this cause we study things and we watch movies and we watch movies with the pastoral lens and we do this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I love the fact that you're giving your friends permission to create their own literal liturgical rituals of grief because yeah it's really limiting to imagine that what the parents and the most immediate loved ones are going to do for your friend or your family member is going to be enough for you i yeah. mean i think about this all the time i've done so many funerals now and i can guarantee you that they're the the person who is the closest immediate relative when somebody dies does not mean that they are the closest living person to that person mm -hmm. it does not mean that Mm -hmm. It does not mean that they were the longest, closest living person to that person. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean they have the deepest relationship with that person. Right. It means that they are the closest living relative. That's all it can be. It can be, it can be a sister from 10 states away who hasn't seen them in 10 years that has the mm -hmm. estate. Mm -hmm. it, could be, it could be a friend. It could be a child. By the way, some children have... I, I'm always surprised at how little children know about their parents when we get to a funeral sometimes or vice versa. Mm-hmm. How little parents know about their children or, or, or brothers know about their sisters or, you know, it's like I, I always joke with people that like I spend more time, you know, at, at the church office with my staff than I ever will with any other family member in my yeah. whole life. Right. Yeah. 
uh, more hours a day, more time in difficult situations and complicated conversations and deep dialogue. So who really knows you? Yeah. Who's really your person and your people? If we can, we can't expect funeral services to provide that. Now, who could do that? I mean, that's an interesting thing because it's like the idea of that every individual person while they're grieving has to come up with their own ritual for the person that they lost. That is, it's, that's, that's hard. That's hard. It's taxing, which is why we should be doing some of this in community, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, even in terms of services, like I feel like our lament and loss service will be very meaningful for some. And then there are going to be other people who need to do this more of a shiva. Is it shiva? Am I saying that right? Where you like at yeah. your house yeah. and you are having dialogue and being able to actually express in a different kind of way. I, I think that we need to be okay with the various ways we can process our grief and our, our lamentations. I don't think lament and loss service is everything, right? I think it's no. a piece. It's a piece of what we try to offer folks, right? But you should be able to have permission to go home and create your own tradition, your own ritual around this. And and let's not let's not downplay the services that are available that we sometimes just don't acknowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So there are counselors, there are therapists, yeah. there are people that we need to be processing our grief. That's another way to process the love that you have for someone once they're gone is to talk about it yeah. with someone who's a paid professional. Uh, and the other is like there's this whole movement of grief doulas. Do you know this bereavement doulas mm -hmm. who will walk with you? And also take kind of a spiritual approach, mm -hmm. um, a little bit different than a chaplain, maybe. Yeah. Um, or even just bereavement services in a hospital, but somebody who will walk with you and even create rituals for you. Yeah. Um, that are in your own life. I think that's the thing that we need to be able to say, okay, I don't have, I know I need this, but I don't have the time and space to do it for myself. So I need yeah. to hire someone. I need to pay someone. I need to contract the services of someone to, to, to walk this journey with me and to create these rituals so that I can kind of express and attend to the sorrow and the grief that I have yeah. that I'm carrying about this. Yeah, I agree. And also we've been talking about death a lot, but what about just the grief of, you know, leaving a job, the grief right. of this COVID situation. I've had a number of colleagues quit their jobs this year as pastors. Mm. And mm. they are experiencing this tremendous grief. You know, now they're in this holiday season period where they're not, working at a church and some of them aren't going back to work at a church yeah right? did, you see, did you see that we should reference that article by oh, uh, Melissa, Melissa Flora Blixler yeah yeah absolutely the great it's like the number one article right now trending in so many different places why are pastors joining the great recession or resignation resignation the great resignation yes we're joining uh, the great recession powerful. as well but yeah yeah yes but we're why are why are pastors resigning you know yeah. it's a powerful piece yeah, I mean, she. I think she lost a little steam at the end of the article because mm -hmm. there's some. Again, it's always this like maybe we don't need the church kind of thing at the end, or the church is going to change. Which I, it's like it feels like that part of the analysis is 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 always is the same. I've heard yeah. that over and over again. But the whole front half of that article, why pastors are resigning and the information about why, was really powerful and important. And I, I, um, I would like to. And I, I know it's going to be hard for some people. I would like to hear more from the pastors who have resigned. So Melissa hasn't, and she's mm -hmm. not planning on it, according to her article, right? Her articles. Right. But I would love for those people to talk about grief. Like, mm -hmm. what is it like to quit your job and not have anything next? And what is it like to, uh, I mean, my friend is in this crisis period of like, I don't even know if I want to do this anymore. And he's, and he's 33, right? It's not like he's 63, he's 33. So, you know, to, to get the grief, the, the underbelly, the grief side of this, what is it actually like to say, I'm walking away from this job, this relationship, nobody had to die for it to happen. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, right. So, yeah, I think that's a, we grieve anything that we lose, whether it be a job, a church, um, a potential future that we thought we had. That's one that a lot of people don't talk about a yeah. potential future, right? Yeah. That's where, that's where like all the struggles between parents and children with gender and sexual identity come from, right? Parents are like, Oh, I'm going to have this wedding. I have this, I have this mental picture in my mind of what's going to wedding bells, children, spouse, you know, grandkids, mm -hmm in their mind and then their you know, child comes to them and says, no, 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 that's not in it for me. Mm -hmm. All those potential hopes and dreams they had for someone come crashing down. You can create new ones, but you have to grieve the loss of the ones that you had first. Yeah. And so it's hard to have patience uh, as we walk through that with people. 
um, when they make dis- very difficult decisions or they, they come to a different understanding of their identity than we, we had for them or that we thought about them. Yeah. Um, this is true of, of people inside a church who had a dream about what the future of the church would be or, or a dream about the past of the church that they love that has changed or died or gone away. And they're wrestling over that loss of that, all that grief. There's that, um, I may have used this before in another time, Mia, where there's that, there's this passage from Ezra. You know, I think I've mentioned it where uh, I got this from a friend of mine who wrote an article about uh, the sense of spiritual homelessness that you can feel even when you're at home Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because things have changed and it's called solastalgia. And, but in that he talks about this passage in Ezra where uh, they've gone back to build the temple and they've got the foundation laid and everybody comes to kind of consecrate the foundation and everybody's, there's this huge loud noise. Everybody's making noise, but half the people are crying and half the people are cheering and rejoicing. Mm -hmm. And the people who are crying are those who had seen the former glory of the temple before it had been destroyed and the foundation of the new temple being built is recalling their grief over the loss of the old temple, not their hope over what's new. The people who'd never seen the old temple right. and don't have any memory of it, they think the foundation is the greatest thing they've ever seen. And so they're excited about what's coming, the newness that's happening. And so you've got two sets of people in the same community. One group's crying, the other group's rejoicing and uh, over the exact same thing, over the foundation of the newness of which is being born. And and, mm-hmm. and that's to me a metaphor of where the church is at in so many places where our church is at and where the, mm-hmm. where the church in general is. And that's a beautiful Christmas story. I mean, I think that I, I like that we've made space for people to grieve and lament and loss, but I also think to be, as opposed to, I like that we've made space and also Christmas Eve could be that. Mm. Mm. Half the people crying, half the people rejoicing if we mm. made space for that, right? But Christmas mm. Eve turns into like, here are our kids and they're singing, woo, Christmas. And what have we made space for to all be one thing, you know, and to honor mm. that and what, so it doesn't have to feel like I have to come to a separate service to attend to my grief, but Christmas Christmas can also be attending to our grief. Mm. Mm-hmm. I know that's a lot. The people aren't going to like that. It's okay. <laughs> well, is there a way, but there, I always think, is there a way in the current liturgical traditions we already have that are built in where you could create a space for that? Yeah. Like, here we are, we have this separate lament and law service with candles, mm-hmm. and then we have candlelight, sa- silent night. Mm-hmm. So what if before silent night, there was a space to name the losses? Yeah, I mean- you know, we, haven't, we haven't done silent night in two years, so we're getting ready to do silent night for the first time in two years. What if there was a carved out space before silent night to say, here's what we lost in the last two years since we've been here, 750,000 Americans, um, you know, yeah. Uh, all time with our relatives, connection, relationships, community. Um, you know. Yeah, I think that, that's part of what's of celebrating what's being born is to to lament, mm. right? What was? Mm. Yeah, I think it's interesting because all the stories that we get are stories of struggle, right? Mm-hmm. Elizabeth hadn't had children for her whole life and then has sort of a surprising pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Zachariah struggles with the news of it. He doesn't know what to do with it. Mary and Joseph struggle with this thing. This new thing is weird. It's not helpful to their relationship, right? It's yeah. actually kind of an interruption in their relationship that almost leads to the to the destruction of it. You know, depending upon which gospel you read, you don't really know what actually happened, right? And yeah. how it was processed. Joseph kind of says, "Well, okay, I'll stick with her." You know, Mary's Mary's like, "It is what it is." You know, um, but it's always the story of it's all struggle. It's never just like joy, pure joy. Yeah, you know, a, a, the baby's born, pure joy. It's all it's like no room in the inn, right? Right, Pain, out in the cave, right? In, so. So when we're singing Silent Night, to be think to the, all those all of those no room in the end moments in our lives, right? No mm. space for grief, mm. no space for lament. Um, you know, the 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 disgusting nature of sleeping in a barn. I mean, like there needs to be there can be more of that to give yeah. people to just exhale. Yeah. There is this um, Christmas, I've preached on this before, but there was some excavation research done in Bethlehem about um, 
like what would the stable have actually been like, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's sort of two theories on this. So the first is that it was like um, really not like a cave way out, like it sounds like in the story or like, you know, like we see in these grottos. That all came from St. Francis in 1200. But that each house had like a bottom floor and an upper floor. And in the bottom floor, it was open in the back and you'd have where you tie your animals up. So just like you have your dog and you bring your dog inside, mm -hmm. they would have like sheep and cows and other different animals, mostly probably sheep. Um, and they maybe have some chickens and stuff like that. And they had a little open space in the first floor. So when it says there's no room, all the upper floor, you know, rooms in the whole village, right, are filled up, they think, or maybe there was room, but they were lying, who knows. Um, and then all they've got is this like garage barn where the animals are, and that's where the baby's born. So like in the first floor of the house, garage level, out, you know, half of it outside, half of it indoors, like a barn, but like a first century barn, not yeah. like, like, not like an outhouse barn or down the street barn. Right dedicated to its own but like still connected to the house and the reason i like that one and then this other image another one is that actually everybody would have been travelers from would have been sleeping in that didn't couldn't get in those houses would have been sleeping in the middle of the town square in a tent mm -hmm. and so what we consider to be the stable would have been like a, t a makeshift tent like a homeless tent in the middle of downtown like the middle of bethlehem right and uh, all this is you know you know, all this is, you know, not necessarily as important to the story, but it's interesting to think about, um, you know, a bunch of travelers all in, in town at the time and the tent in the, in somewhere in there, you know, Jesus being born right there amidst all these people mm -hmm. or being in the first floor of a house where there are other people living, but there's no room for them in a true tr traditional room, but they have to be in the barn. So it's not like they're like set, you know, like it's always this like image that they're like set off in a barn somewhere. And the only people that see them are angels and shepherds. Yeah. You know, but in reality, they might have been like the whole thing might have been happening with them surrounded by people on all sides, you know, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, like you talked about with a party, you can be in the midst of a party surrounded by people and still can feel totally alone. Yeah. 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 Or have to step away to deal with your... To deal with your whatever your process, your whatever you're feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. <sighs> Mary had a lot of things to ponder in her heart. You know? <laughs> I'm sure things. she did. There was somebody I saw on Twitter today as we wrap up. I saw on Twitter today somebody was like, they had this, I wish I could, I should have taken a screenshot, but they were saying, you know, Mary had just given birth and she had breastfed Jesus. And here comes this little drummer boy talking about, I have something for you. <laughs> <laughs> that like, ain't they didn't want to hear that shit. <laughs> that is a story. It was a, it was a drummer boy, Parumpa Pum Pum. Keep it right. quiet. I'm just gonna keep this baby asleep. Right. You know, no crying. He makes my, you know, whatever. That's some <laughs> gnostic crap right there. That's a bad theology. <laughs> oh. oh well, this this is good. Good conversation yeah. today, man. I hope and that we, um you all enjoyed it and took something from it. Yeah, and our hearts and our hearts and our prayers are with anybody who's going through grief in this season. Yeah, it's hard. It's we hope you come to the Lament and Loss service if you can or find your own rituals. Yeah. Well, we'll see you next week for our last episode. Um, and we hope it's a good one. We hope you have a good week and talk to you later. Peace. Friends, that was our episode this week. As always, please email your questions and your suggestions to Reverend Mia McLean at mmcclain at myersparkbaptist.org. Until next time, take care. This is Sacred Justice. <laughs>